Excellent. Well, welcome back, uh, everyone, and thanks very much for hosting this event and uh, facilitating, Anthony. We really appreciate it. Um, usually, for a phosphor g conference, Andrea and myself do a state of GeoServer update, which talks a little bit bigger picture about what's going on with the project as a whole. Um, but it's such a busy project that stresses us out. So today for this online session, we're being a little bit more relaxed and we're just going to talk about the new fun things that are available in the latest GeoServer uh, 2.17 release. Um, so just starting off with a quick overview. Um, we release GeoServer a couple times a year. Uh, we're uh, doing major releases of 2.16 uh, and 2.17 and 2.18. Um, so for the GeoServer 2.17 uh, release, uh, it was initially released in April um, 2020. This is a few months late because we were changing build infrastructure. Um, and it was released alongside GeoTools uh, 23.0. This is the first stable release of the 2.17 series. Um, just last week, um, I released uh, the first point release there, 2.17.1. Um, how this works is GeoServer is going to get four more. Oh, okay. Oh, uh, Sorry. GeoServer is going to get uh, a few more releases. Uh, each release series lasts for a year. So the first four, uh, the first releases are considered stable. They get a few new features are getting backported. And then it goes into a maintenance mode where only bug fixes uh, and security updates are, are backported. Uh, this release runs on Java 8 or Java 11. We really recommend using OpenJDK um, version 8. Um, yeah. So the other thing that's happening here is GeoServer, in addition to that core application, has a series of optional installs or extensions. Uh, you can see some of them on the screen ahead of you. The ones I've placed a star next to are new for this release. So we're going to talk a little bit about the Mapbox styling extension and also this resource browser tool extension. Okay, we also have a kind of an experimental R&D play area called uh, community modules. And we've got a couple community modules that are you know, kind of act active R&D that we'd like to talk about. Um, so Flat Geobuffer, GSR plugin, and the OGC API plugin are, are new R&D projects this release. Um, so with that intro, I'm going to dive right into uh, the first batch of updates. And by that, I mean I'm going to hand the microphone over to Andrea. Hello. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, we, we got a bunch of um, styling improvements, especially in the Mapbox style plugin. Uh, Jody pushed it from a community to extension status which means you will find it among the releases as a numbered uh, module, as opposed to being a community module that you can only find in the nightly builds. The use case for this module, uh, the, the Mapbox style plugin, is to reuse the, the Mapbox GL styles on the server side as well. For those cases where you want uh, to have an hybrid architecture where you publish Mapbox vector tiles, but will want to also retain the ability to publish PNGs so that you have a, a fully standard OGC service, but also allow to use vector tiles on the side. Uh, next slide. Yeah, I'm just going to interject there. This was originally a community module started by Boundless. Um, and then my new employer, Geocat, has allowed me some time to pick this up and take this R&D project and domesticate it and uh, put it in the release. Yep. Um, a few months ago, uh, as part of, uh, as a, uh, of a contract with GeoSolutions, we, we actually did a, a bunch of improvements uh, onto uh, the translation because keep in mind that GeoServer at its core basically only speaks SLD. Every other language gets translated down to an object model which is uh, strongly inspired by SLD itself. So. The translation from Mapbox to the subject model was uh, lacking a few features and uh, was not mimicking correctly uh, a few of the behaviors of Mapbox style. We uh, did a bunch of improvements and uh, uh, corrected uh, an, a number of issues. Next slide. 
and uh, right now, uh, if you if you take uh, the Open Map Tiles GL Bright uh, Mapbox Vector um, Mapbox GL style, you can actually run it on on GeoServer and produce a, a, an output which looks by um, by all intents and purposes just like the one you would get on the client side. Of course, there are more uh, small differences because the leveling engine is not the same, but um, I mean, I guess that if I put you in front of this map, you wouldn't have been able to tell that it was rendered server side by GeoServer. Next. Um, in order to make things work, we had to make a number of uh, map engine improvements, uh, such as, for example, uh, background teal, associate symbols with labels, uh, font shrinking, and so on. Uh, the um, the Mapbox GL work was not the only driver for improvements. There were also other improvements that were unrelated to it, and we are going to have a look at, at them one by one. So next. Uh, this is derived from Mapbox GL. In Mapbox GL, you can set the background color. In SLD, you cannot, uh, because typically the background color comes from the get map request. However, we added an extension uh, to the SLD, so it's, it's a vendor extension for GeoServer, that allows you to specify an SLD background element to specify a color or a fill, like for example, you could have a PNG with the waves to represent the water as the background, and that would also work. Next. Uh, another thing that we noticed is that uh, when uh, Mapbox GL styles uh, works with uh, um, icons with labels, either both the icon and the label show up or none of them does. In GeoServer, typically you represent an icon with a label below it as a point symbolizer and a text symbolizer. But being two independent elements means that one shows up and the other doesn't mm -hmm. sometime. So, we already have this ability to put a, um, a background image uh, below a label to do text, uh, do road label shields, but it was always centering the, the shield be behind the label uh, in the same position. And we wanted to actually push the label below. Uh, so we added a new vendor option, graphic, graphic placement, that allows to offset the, the symbol and the label independently getting this result of uh, having the uh, bike and the, mm, the label below it, but uh, uh, making, making it so that they either appear both of them or none of them. And this is shown in the next slide. So you can see the giant store Notre Dame on the Ile de Paris. And uh, as I zoom in, uh, there are other labels that start showing up, which interfere with uh, the, um, a bike shop and uh, the bike shop uh, label disappears and as a result also the the point. You might want or not want this behavior. The thing is now it's possible before it wasn't. Next. Another thing that uh, th this one has been contributed by um, uh, the community. It was not done by a core developer. Uh, in a, a number of maps, you want to try very hard to label a certain polygon, especially if it's a cadastral maps or something where, you know, the labels really need to be uh, present. So um, with this new vendor option, you can set a target minimum size for the font, which means GeoServer will start uh, trying to label the, um, the polygon with the normal size, and if it fails because the label is too big or if there is a conflict, it's gonna try to shrink it a bit more and a bit more and then a bit more until it reaches the, the target minimum size. And this, of course, increases the number of um, labels that appear on the map. Next. Um, another thing that we did, um, this one uh, was not related with uh, Mapos GL, was this ability to drape a symbol along the line. It was already possible, but the thing is, it was just repeating the symbol along the line. It was not trying to make it continuous. So you get, you were getting all these interruptions at, at bands. Right now with this new vendor option um, mark along line, you, you can actually force the renderer to uh, connect the, the various repeat symbols uh, to generate a continuous uh, symbology. Moving on. 
Um, uh, okay, so, uh, right. Along with the Mapbox uh, styles, we have this new ability to read the Mapbox vector tiles stored in an MB tiles file. So an MB tiles is just a SQLite uh, tile storage with two simple tables, uh, at least those are the mandatory ones. And uh, uh, you can actually stuff vector tiles into it. And typically the metadata table contains the description of the vector tiles, such as which layers there are and what attributes they have. Um, so GeoServer now can read one of these Mapbox vector tiles data sources and publish it as, as a WMS layer. So next slide. Um, uh, in, uh, um, uh, it, it was interesting to, to develop this because uh, data is styled, but when we do WMS, data is no more tiled. So the use case for this store is not to get the vector tiles and render, render them uh, server side just because you can, but because um, the target uh, use case is to, to take these vector tiles which were already generated and then paint the WMS maps in another coordinate reference system or just send back PNGs and so on. So the funny thing is that um, in vector tiles, typically data is split and when you draw the borders around the polygons, you would get the disconnects and, and the like, or even when rendering thick lines. So typically there is a, a, a buffer in each tile that we have to handle and uh, we modified the render so that uh, um, it, it leverages the buffer to generate a continuous symbology like it's shown in the image on the right. And if you want to learn more about this uh, buffering thing, uh, there's a link at the, at the bottom that, uh, that explains it. Next slide. So right now you can literally take two things out of open map tiles. You can take the uh, MB tiles vector tiles container. And I have this in the screenshot, the, the planet from um, some time ago, um, uh, which is uh, 55 gigabytes. So vector tiles for the entire planet uh, at uh, I think 14 or 15 zoom levels. And then you can add on top of it um, the open map tiles Mapbox GL styles and have GeoServer render them as PNGs. The interesting bit is in whatever projection you want because that was really the driver. You uh, provide the common case as MBTs directly in the client, but then be, being able to, to switch to whatever other projection and render PNGs instead. Uh, because, well, you don't want to uh, have a 54 gigabytes worth of storage times the number of projections you want to support, at least not in the use case of the, the, the sponsor of this feature. Next slide. Uh, yeah, um, to my surprise, WMS cascading got a number of improvements. Uh, so WMS cascading is this ability to connect it to another WMS server and uh, basically proxy it uh, and, and add some extra functionality on top of it, such as, for example, read the data in another, uh, read the, the, the maps in one projection and reproject them in another, or uh, uh, act as a tunnel for some security reasons and, and the like. Well, WMS Cascading got uh, a bunch of improvements uh, during this year, um, such as choosing the cascading format, limiting, um, the scale range at which the cascading is performed and limiting uh, the, um, the bounding box, the area under which the, the cascading is performed because there are some servers out there which uh, literally start throwing exceptions uh, outside of the, the bounding box they declare, which is not totally correct, but uh, there, there it is. Uh, next slide. Um, okay, so this this is go, this actually goes beyond uh, map rendering. Uh, so this is the JSON LD community module. It, it's it's about uh, uh, producing outputs. So typically in WFS you can uh, go and ask for uh, features in GML, but also in GeoJSON. Uh, JSON LD is an alternative uh, JSON format which has uh, some uh, semantic basis and some context information that provide 
um, it could provide a, a schema and it provides a definition for each element because typically what you miss in 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 JSON is the definition of uh, what uh, what each attribute means. So uh, in GeoServer we now have a Geo uh, JSON LD community module that can be driven by templates so that you can build the exact shape of JSON LD you want out of your data source, be it a simple uh, features data source such as a shape file or a PostGIS table or a complex one such as an app schema uh, mapping. Next slide. Uh, this continues to show the, the mapping file. As you can see, the mapping file is the uh, JSON LD uh, file itself with a few interpolations here and there to pick the elements that you want out of the original data source. And uh, yeah, you can, uh, you can write uh, a, a template file for each um, data set that you want to publish via JSON-LD. Next. Okay, so uh, some news and updates about services. Go ahead. About five minutes, um, Andrea. All right, so um, we have this new OGC API community module that you can download. Uh, it contains a features API implementation for these uh, RESTful services that OGC is, has been developing, but also an implementation of the Tiles API, which is an equivalent of WMTS, and something new like the Styles API, which allows you to fetch styles from the server and if you have a write access, even to add styles on the server, which is pretty handy uh, if you want to fetch vector tiles and then figure out, uh, well, okay, what am I, how am I going to render them? Well, you can go to the style service and say, okay, which styles are compatible which, with uh, this feature collection and, uh, and get the uh, uh, Mapbox GL styles or SLDs because, well, SLD can be processed on the, on the client side as well and, and do, do the rendering on the client side. Next. It's also pretty interesting to, uh, to have this fl new flat GeoBuff community module, which is an alternative, let's say, to GML and GeoJSON. Uh, it's a performant binary encoding for geographic data based on flat buffers. If you look at the comparison table, you will find that it's generally smaller than GeoJSON and, and GML uh, and quite a bit faster. So it's, it's a very efficient alternative to do to those two formats. And it's also used on the server side for other reasons, such as a temporary storage for uh, uh, processing chains, for example. Uh, next. We had some improvements in GWAP cache. Let's go ahead, next. So one is a faster startup. Uh, here we are talking about a, a GWAP cache integrated with GeoServer. Loading the tile layers uh, has been, uh, um, let's say, a problem when you had many layers. Gabriel Roldan here has done uh, some tests with one million layers in a single GeoServer, which is pretty amazing in my opinion. And uh, we have the timings of the GeoServer startup and the Geo Cache startup. As you can see over time, besides some hiccups along the road, the, the startup time improved, especially the the time to read the, the, the Tyler definition for GWC improved quite a bit over time. And uh, so if you have a fast machine now, you can literally start a GeoServer with 1 million layers in, layers in like seven minutes. Uh, the tile layers page is also, uh, was also a pain point. Uh, listen, the, the tile layers was a slow. We improved it quite a bit in 217. Next. And uh, um, we were talking about storage uh, of tiles. So Geocache by default stores tiles on, on the disk using a, um, a disk structure, uh, directory structure, which is a bit strange, let's say, but it optimizes the, the number of files per directory so that certain file systems such as NTFS are not getting killed by it. Uh, however, now you can also set uh, 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 X, Y, Z or uh, TMS layout, and then seed your uh, tile cache and then throw it at S3 directly or, or onto Apache and serve it as a static cache. Next. Also very important, uh, we exposed uh, a number of controls to uh, make GeoCache more tolerant to tile failures 
during seeding. Uh, before this, Geo Cache was just ending the, the seeding thread at the first tile failure that, it, uh, uh, that happened. Now you can control how many failures it's going to tolerate before giving up. So it's going to make uh, seeding much more robust. Next. Okay, Thank you, Andrea. So I think I'm going to take over this section talking a little bit about some of the configuration improvements that have been made. Um, just to start out with a really nice creature comfort. Um, now when you're working on a workspace or a layer or a layer group, there's a new tab for the security settings. So you can actually control who has access right there without having to duck over to the, secure, the correct security configuration screen. And this just makes working with GeoServer a lot more efficient as an administrator. So uh, it sounds like a small thing, but it just makes GeoServer more of a pleasure to use. So I really appreciate that. And this is another kind of really fun creature comfort. There's an option now, if you dig into the other settings, you can put a little checkbox on called show time of creation and modification uh, in the admin list. And then when you go through the rest of GeoServer, there's two new columns, uh, date created and date modified. And you can use that to sort to see what layers have been modified, you know, most recently. And this is just really handy if you're working on a couple layers. Um, because you can see uh, you can see what you're working on rather than having to duck into the third screen and all of that. So it's um, just nice creature comforts for people who set up GeoServer frequently um, or set up many layers. This makes it easier to use. Um, <clears throat> another new addition here is the ability to add custom dimensions for vector layers. So we're used to the vector layers working or supporting for things like time and elevation, but now you can um, also map uh, uh, custom uh, dimension ranges. Uh, this used to be something that was only supported for raster data, and with this release of GeoServer, you can now do that for vector data as well. Um, excellent. I think that appears to be all. I thought I was going to talk about the resource browser, but I don't see that anywhere, Andrea. I'm sorry. Let me fire the questions at you, and then if you want to talk about that, if anybody, uh, I'm sure people are interested, so that they can stick around. But uh, we've got a few questions, so I'm just going to start straight off. So first of all, a comment from Mark, who um, we all saw presenting earlier, who says the Mapbox styles stuff is really cool. So thumbs up from Mark from that one. Um, a, uh, a question from Pretty Moy, who says, uh, does GeoService support Blob Store AWS S3 to yes. store raster layers out of the box? Yes. Wait. Uh, yeah. It, 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 so for tiles, yes, tiles can be stored uh, on the file system, S3, Azure Blobs, and uh, uh, SQLite. Uh, as GeoTIFFs, if we are talking about cloud-optimized GeoTIFFs, there is a, uh, a plugin that allows to uh, publish single GeoTIFF files, but it doesn't work along, it doesn't play well with the image mosaic. And I think recently, yeah, you mentioned the Azure Blobs as well. Okay, so this is one from Paul, which is kind of UK specific. Um, it says, I wonder if we'll get a method of using WMS Cascade with the OS, that is Ordnance Survey Maps API, to allow people to effectively have a, a local cache and limit hits on the payable service. So i.e., you know, taking advantage of WMS ca Cascade to, to kind of cut your costs on, on uh, hits from a commercial API, uh, you may not be able to answer that one, but that's just throwing that out, I guess. If it's a, a standard WMS server, it can be done already. Uh, and yes, you can you can cache the tiles as, as long as uh, the, the contract that you have with Ordinal Survey allows for that, which is something that you should check. Um, uh, if it's a custom API, then the code needs to be written and it's possible. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. I'm sure, I'm sure OS won't be listening, so, you know, uh, Paul can, uh, can look into that. Uh, another couple of questions from Mark, who says, uh, firstly, will we get GeoServer 3.x anytime soon? Probably or will not. Will there just be 2.x, 2.x plus one, et cetera? 
So uh, when we switched from 1x to 2x, there were two very big changes. The user interface looked completely different and the storage of the configuration of GeoServer was also completely different. There was uh, an automatic upgrade mechanism that made it transparent, but I mean, the, the change was really big. And uh, I'm not sure we are gonna have a, a change of this magnitude anytime soon. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we change major version numbers when the configuration on disk does a, a major refactor. And we don't see the need to do that right now. Our existing structure is being is proven quite flexible. So not in the foreseeable future. And that's a, a good thing that the project is being stable. Yep. Okay, no change for the sake of change. Uh, another one from Mark. So Mark says, um, how well is GeoServer to be run in cloud environments? And related to that, are there any plans for a official optimized Docker version of GeoServer? And then he says, or even Helm charts and so on. So we did talk to various companies that are, that are publishing doc, GeoServer Docker images after Phosphor-G last year. And we had a meeting with them, uh, encouraging them to combine forces, um, but there hasn't been any appetite to, there hasn't been any volunteers to go ahead and publish an official Docker image. Um, we do have Docker image hosting on the OSGO uh, repository now. The project's gonna be using that for site automation, but uh, we don't have uh, any volunteer that's interested in uh, working on this right now. So we're not against it. We just don't have anyone who's for it. Yeah, th there's also the thing that GeoServer has a lot of var variety with all the extensions and plugin. And uh, when we surveyed how the, the Docker images were built, each one had uh, their own little set of plugins that they couldn't do without and that others wouldn't have would have wanted to, to have in their Docker, Docker image instead. Okay, so Paul's come back on the OS Maps API and says he thinks permissions are fine. Uh, so I guess that may be something for continued discussion on the OSGO UK mailing list for anybody that's interested in that. Um, and the last question I've got so far is from David. This picks up on something that was discussed in the previous session. Uh, David says, what are the, um, What's the optimum raster format for very large images in 2.17? So it says, for example, should he convert his ECWs to, yeah, 217. Should he convert his ECWs to GeoTIFF? Yeah. For example. Uh, 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 so uh, ECW is is a great format. It's uh, it compresses very well. It can be lossless. It um, um, it's fast. However, it it has one uh, uh, significant Achilles heel you have to pay to use it on the server side. Uh, plugins to use it on the, on the desktop are free, but uh, whenever you use it on a server to publish, then you have to pay. And uh, the first thing that you wanna do is to go and uh, check with uh, Hexagon, I think uh, nowadays, uh, mm -hmm. about uh, the license cost of doing that. And then if you want, there, is the, the, there are the GDAL plugins uh, for GeoServer that include the ECW support. To be honest, uh, I don't remember having a GeoSolutions customer using ECW in the last eight to 10 years. So it's, it's uncommon. Typically people take the, the ECWs and they convert them into GeoTIFFs with JPEG compression, keeping the compression low to avoid uh, artifacts. Okay, and, uh, and a follow up on the earlier discussion about blob storage from Pritamoy. Uh, so do you see any performance issues if you use blob, a blob store for raster layer, raster layer storage? So uh, to, to store tiles, you mean? Uh, I'm, I'm, I would know. No, is the answer. Um, for uh, GeoTIFFs instead. Let's see. Uh, I'm gonna unmute, um, ask unmute. Uh, yes, yeah, for the GeoDiff. Okay, uh, so uh, there is one layout. Uh, uh, GeoTiff uh, 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 is a very rich format. There is one layout, which is cloud-optimized GeoTiff, which is optimized for storing the TIFF in, in S3 or blob storage in general, which allows you to do very efficient range requests and only get to the part of the file that you want. Uh, 
the right now we don't have a plugin that leverages this layout the s3 GeoTIFF plugin that i was talking about before basically <clears throat> slices the file in five megabytes block and uses some local caching to uh, to save it so you can literally throw whatever tiff layout on, on, in s3 uh, given there is this local caching uh, the the perform the, the performance is not bad unless you start hit, hitting the, the network a lot uh, the direction that we are going is to have a plugin that actually uses the COG file structure to avoid the caching and still do optimal file transfers. As long as you have your blob storage and your server in, in close to each other, like uh, in let's say in, in AWS in the same region, mm -hmm. it should be just fine at that point. But we are not there yet. And uh, one more, if I may, uh, uh, one more question from me. Uh, is uh, that the one million um, uh, uh, layers, you said that if you have a one million layers in your GeoSurvey, it takes only seven minutes to load. Uh, mm -hmm. We are using a, quite an old version, which is taking an hour or so to load the one million. So I hope if I just upgrade to 2.17, it should improve a lot, uh, yeah. just, just the loading time. Right, yeah, yeah. There, there's also another option, which is to use the JDBC config uh, plugin, um, uh, which doesn't load the configuration from the database. It loads it uh, uh, basically on a per request basis. I tested it recently, the, like the startup time is basically constant no matter what, how many layers you have. However, even with the last improvements, like I tested a month ago, you are gonna take a heavy hit on the, on the single get map, like the overhead is significant. Ah, okay. Especially, okay. especially when you have many layers. Yeah, we have more than one million. <laughs> okay. No, in that case, uh, I would keep them on the file system okay. and uh, switch to G0217. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna interject with a slide I lost somehow. Uh, there's a new tool here called Resource Browser. This allows you to look at the contents of your data directory. Um, you can upload your icons and fonts. You can actually even edit small configuration files like those templates we saw earlier or control flow properties is this example. Um, and so this just gives our web administration program some of the functionality that was previously only available in, through the REST API. Um, and so that's an optional install and it shows up in the tools menu. So just a last feature that somehow escaped my slides. Sorry about that. Yeah, pretty handy when uh, you are working against a remote geo server and for any reason you don't have SSH or SFTP access to the machine. To, yeah. You know, do file transfers directly. That's great. So I'm just going to give you a couple of other questions and I think we need to, to wrap up. It's uh, we're already running over time. So obviously there's a lot of interest in this. Um, and these are the last two questions I've got in any case. So uh, firstly, uh, Denilson says, can I, may I use raster in geo package format? And the second question about rasters from Shailesh is, what is the best way to publish raster stored in Postgres with GeoServer? So raster okay. in geo, geo package and raster in Postgres. Okay, so um, in, in geo package, the, the core geo package allows to store PNG and JPEG tiles uh, into, into the geo package and that's supported and it's working fine. We, we are actually, uh, my company is publishing a 500 gigabyte uh, geo package stuffed with uh, JPEG and PNGs, which covers the entire planet. It's a Sentinel-2 cloudless uh, composite. Uh, however, uh, there is also uh, an official extension to support raster data uh, in terms of digital elevation models or, you know, whatever is not an image. And that one is not supported yet. With some development, it could be. Uh, it's just a matter of throwing resources at that development. Uh, in terms of reading um, uh, data from, uh, raster data from PostGIS, uh, there are two plugins. They are both unsupported at this point. Uh, they are the Image Mosaic JDBC uh, store, which has lost its maintainer years ago, and we just moved it down to from extension to community. And there is a new dedicated uh, PostGIS raster plugin, which also has been donated but doesn't have a maintainer. Mm -hmm. uh, 
more or less the, the, the issue with both is that they are not driving business and uh, it's difficult to, to keep them up if uh, we, we never use them during working hours. So those are your two options, but as a, if you go there, I would suggest uh, looking for uh, some sort of support uh, along the way because there is no one officially maintaining them. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, driven by business. If your organization uses this functionality, um, we just need someone to take, uh, to do the care and feeding of these modules and answer questions on the user list and so on. Uh, we try to be honest with folks if, uh, a component is not being supported and we mark it as such. Right. Um, before demoting the Image Mosaic GDBC to, from extension to community, I actually asked, uh, asked on, uh, the, on various mailing lists to, yeah. for a new maintainer, but no one showed up. So if you are interested, you're more than welcomed and we can push the, the module back up to supported land, to official extension.